Uh, yeah, welcome. Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Isaac Hart. I am the resident director of the American Center for Mongolian Studies. And um, this info session is about our summer 2024 uh, field school program. And I'm just trying, I'm on two screens here, so I'm trying to figure out how to advance my slides. And it's not working. There we go. So uh, about the American Center for Mongolian Studies. Um, the center was founded in 2002, uh, where we've been around for 23 years, 21 years now. Um, but our our Ulaanbaatar office, uh, it, which is here in Ulaanbaatar, and our research library opened in 2004. We have a full-time staff here in Mongolia, and our local staff uh, is will be the support staff for our field school programs. Um, I, uh, Isaac Hart, that's my name. I am the resident director. I just moved to Ulaanbaatar in November of 2023. So I've been here for just a few months, um, but I'm really excited to, to take the reins of this organization here in Mongolia. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization. We're a consortium of international universities and private members, and we support all uh, scholars interested in Mongolian studies research. Uh, we Functionally, we serve as the academic embassy in Ulaanbaatar, so the embassy of the of Western academia uh, to the rest of the world, to Mongolia. So we have the international and Mongolian staff who help visiting local scholars do research and build resources here uh, and build connections and networks. So functionally, we're the home away from home for Western academics coming to Mongolia. And our, our programs include research fellowships, uh, summer field schools, which we're gonna talk about today, uh, we have a, a Mongolian language program, and we have a newsletter um, this month in Mongolian studies, uh, which if you email us at info at mongolia at mongoliacenter.org, um, you can sign up for our monthly newsletter. Um, so one of our, our biggest main programs is our field research fellowships. Uh, these are fellowships for uh, scholars to come to Mongolia and do field research in Mongolia. Usually we award up to $4,000 to support uh, four to six weeks of field work in Mongolia. Um, typically, we have a lot of um, researchers in the social sciences, anthropologists, archaeologists, as well as ecologists, wildlife biologists, a, a range of, of scientists who want to come to Mongolia to study um, a variety of, of fields here. Uh, and so this field research fellowships supports uh, this program supports only U.S. citizens because it's funded by the United States State Department. Um, but the, the program priority is to support individuals from non-research intensive universities and colleges, especially those who are helping guide students in research projects or who can show how the fellowship experience will enhance their teaching and outreach. Uh, so we, a, a wide range of people who um, we support to come to Mongolia and do field research. And these applications can be submitted by just students or by faculty or postdoctoral scholars who are um, interested in coming to Mongolia and doing some kind of field research project. And uh, typically uh, we ask people to identify Mongolian sponsors who will uh, support and make sure that the field research uh, projects are successful. Another main program that we offer is our Mongolian language program. Uh, we have courses throughout the year. Um, this this image here shows our language instructor, Tsirma uh, instructing in the blue shirt there. That's Dr. William Taylor, who we'll talk about in a second. He's the co-instructor for this. He's the lead instructor for our Horses in History course. Uh, but he's been studying with Tsirma for many years now, and he's our probably our most accomplished Mongolian language student that we've had over the years. But Tsirma leads, uh, she teaches individually on a, on Zoom calls or here in person in our office. And uh, she has several American students that visit 
in the office, uh, Peace Corps volunteers and other Americans that are here trying to learn Mongolian, as well as people that log in via Zoom and she gives them language instruction. But we also have an intensive Mon Mongolian language program that runs basically for two months, um, almost three months here in Ulaanbaatar. And um, that program, the application is due March 1st, 2024. But that program is basically you come here and it's just full intensive um, five days a week uh, courses in the in the classroom and very intensive Mongolian language study program. Uh, we've had a lot of success over the years with this program, uh, getting people to very um, competent levels of Mongolian language fluency. The third main fellowship program that we have here in at ACMS is our librarian fellowship. So we have several librarians that want to come to Mongolia to do work related to improving um, the general library system here in Mongolia, as well as ACMS has the largest language of Mongolian studies literature in the English language in the world. We have over 5,000 books in our library here in Ulaanbaatar. And so we provide this library research fellowship to support librarians coming to UB to work in our library, as well as other Mongolian libraries um, to develop access to academic resources and training um, specifically for Mongolian studies literature. So ACMS has been running, we've been hosting um, various academic groups and individuals coming to Mongolia since our inception uh, in 2002. And we've had many different groups involved in different aspects of Mongolian field studies, and we've hosted and led people to the field many, many times. Um, our formal Mongolia field school was first held in 2019, um, one year before the pandemic kind of ruined everything. Uh, so we had a couple of years of break where it was, we had a one year of online field school. And then back in 2022 and 2023, again, we were back on site in Mongolia. So we have had a, a formal Mongolia field school program going since 2019. For 2024, uh, we have three sessions, three courses offered in two different sessions. So we have one session offered July 20th to 28th, and then two sessions running concurrently from July 29th until August 11th. And participants can take one course, or uh, if, if you want to, you can sign up for the first course and the second course, uh, the second session, one of the courses in the second session. All the courses will start and end in Ulaanbaatar, and they will all include a significant field component in the Mongolian countryside. Um, and I should just note here that our field school is open to all participants from any country, including undergraduate, graduate students, teachers and faculty, lifelong learners, eco-tourists, anybody that wants to come to Mongolia and uh, essentially have a vacation where they learn something. Um, so we're, we're open to everybody. Like I said, the first course uh, will run July 20th to 28th. It says uh, 27th on here, um, but we added an extra day to the, the first session because we wanted to make sure that we weren't offering a field school where every single day we're spending five hours driving across the countryside. So we added an extra day so that we can stop one more time towards the end and sort of have fewer hours in the car. Uh, Mongolia is a big country and there will be a significant amount of travel with all of these programs. Uh, so be prepared to traverse a vast landscape. So the second session, July 29th to August 11th, we have two courses. Pustai National Park, Managing Biodiversity in the Home of Mongolia's Native Horses, and Steppe Ethnographies, Mobile, past mobile Pastoralism, Cosmology, and Development in Rural Mongolia. As I said, you can take one course in either session, or if you want to take two, you can take the Horses and History course, and then one of the other two courses. Yeah. 
Each of our courses will have approximately 15 to 20 international and Mongolian participants. The language in, of instruction will be English. All of our instructors speak English and many of them also speak Mongolian. So our instructors can serve as both the instructors and translators. For example, if we're going out in the countryside and interacting with people who don't speak English, previ previous experience in Mongolia or with field studies is not required. Uh, it's certainly uh, helpful to have experience out in rural settings to come to Mongolia. Participants are responsible for making their own travel arrangements to and from Ulaanbaatar. We can help with accommodations uh, in, in Ulaanbaatar before and after the program. We can, for example, you know, make hotel arrangements for you. Uh, we can't pay for the hotel arrangements other than the night before the first day of the field school and the night of the last day of the field school. ACMS will cover your hotel costs. Um, most participants will arrive via air, uh, although you can get on a train in Beijing and come from China. And that's a really interesting experience. If you, if you have the opportunity to, to do that, I recommend it. Um, during the program, uh, we will make all transportation, accommodation, and meal arrangements for the group, and we will all travel together as a class. As far as the tuition is concerned, uh, the first session is is much shorter than the other sessions, and the first session's tuition is one thousand seven hundred fifty U.S. dollars. Um, the second session is three thousand five hundred dollars for for international participants. Uh, Mongolian participants have a separate tuition and fellowship schedule, so you can check with us for what the the tuition and fellowship um, numbers will be. Fellowships of five hundred to two thousand dollars will be available. For, um, for international participants based on merit and need through generous support of the Henry Luce Foundation. And so the, the priority deadline to be considered for a fellowship is March 30th. So if you apply for March 30th and indicate that you want to be considered for a fellowship, uh, you can be. And um, after March 30th, we will make decisions based on the total amount of funding that we have to give to fellows and the number of people who have applied for fellowships. And um, we, tr we try to be as generous as we can with the fellowships to help to support the maximum number of people coming here as possible. So the, the once you've been accepted, the deadline for uh, paying the deposit for the field school is April 10th. So we should be able to get everyone who, um, we should be able to notify fellowship recipients um, before hopefully April 5th so that people can make their final decision before April 10th and then pay the deposit and get their travel arrangements done. Uh, the final field school application deadline is May 30th. Um, so please review the detailed application information on the program website. Uh, all our applications are submitted through the online system, and that's at mongoliacenter.org slash MFS24. And our application, we ask everyone to submit a statement of interest, a statement of experience in remote areas, a curriculum vitae, a, and personal details, and an optional letter of recommendation. As I mentioned, fellowships are open for all, and they will be given on a financial need first and uh, basis in an effort to create a diverse co cohort of participants and to maximize the number of people that can come here. As far as academic credit is concerned, we can't at this point offer academic credits directly because we are not an academic institution, uh, but all our courses are designed to be equivalent to three to six credit university uh, courses in the United States. and. In the past, we have worked with institutions in the United States to uh, to get credit, to get academic credit for individuals who have participated in our field school. And typically the way that works is they will enroll for an independent study and they will communicate, the, the home institution will communicate with us about uh, how many hours a week the student will be working and we, we might arrange some kind of exam or essay uh, to be completed at the end of the course and then evaluate 
the exam or the essay. Um, so people have taken, got received academic credit for participating in our field schools before, um, but we don't at this point directly offer academic credit. For as far as COVID-19 is concerned, um, Mongolia has a, a very high vaccination rate and um, they had a very low infection rate throughout the pandemic, um, mostly because they completely shut the country down for 2021 and 2020. Um, but there is no disruption to uh, summer 2024 travel anticipated. Uh, that being said, our deposits are refundable if the program is canceled with some restrictions if you cannot attend. Um, there are multiple ways to get here to Ulaanbaatar and uh, you should investigate the different routes. Um, there are multiple flights from Europe as well as from different locations in Asia. There's a couple flights from Tokyo and Seoul and Beijing. Uh, the main the main ways people get here are usually through Istanbul or through Seoul, um, but there are a few other options. Um, it can be cheaper. I've heard this. It can be cheaper to book your legs separately. So if you're coming from uh, Los Angeles, for example, it might be cheaper to book a ticket from Los Angeles to Seoul and then book a separate itinerary from Seoul to Ulaanbaatar. Uh, I haven't seen that personally, but I've I've heard that indirectly. Uh, I should say one um, one of our students who has already accepted and paid the deposit and everything and has already booked her flights is planning on staying in Istanbul a couple days after the field schools, and she has um, offered to for me to share her email address with other students if uh, if they want to also stay in Istanbul for a few days afterwards. So field travel in the countryside. So these are these courses will all have a significant component of uh, time spent in the Mongolian countryside. Um, the the horses in history course will spend a bit of time in Kharhorin and as well as up in Khovskol province. The Hustai Park course will spend a considerable most of the time in Hustai National Park, and the Steppe Ethnographies course will spend a significant of time in and around the the town of Bainhongor, which is out in um, in the countryside. So you will have a considerable amount of time away from uh, amenities that you may be used to, and be prepared to not have access to things that you might think of as necessities uh, in, the, in the Western world. But yeah, this is a, a very unique opportunity that combines, combines expert-led academic studies together with special cultural insights and experiences. Um, this is really a, a once in a lifetime and a unique experience uh, in the world of uh, of field schools, of ecotourism. Um, th it's really a, a unique opportunity we have. So I'm going to jump right in now to our first course offering that we're, we're having this summer, um, Horses in History, How the Mongols and Their Horses Reshaped the World. So the, the lead instructor for this course is William Taylor, who is a curator at the a natural History Museum at the University of Colorado Boulder and a assistant professor there in Colorado. Um, we're we're letting our North American people have a break today uh, because of the timing of these uh, this Zoom meeting. So Will's not going to be joining us, um, but he is probably the world's leading archaeozoologist on uh, horse domestication and horse culture of Mongolia. Uh, I, of course, will also be joining us. I have been working here in Mongolia with Dr. Taylor since 2017. Um, Dr. Taylor has been has been working here since 2010 as a Fulbright Scholar and as a ACMS Field Research Fellow uh, on a variety of projects, and he is now co-leading several projects in uh, Western Mongolia, 
dealing with ice patch archaeology and uh, excavating some really important cave sites here in Mongolia. So he's he's really a, a leading uh, Mongolian archaeological scholar, uh, and I I have been working with him since 2017. And um, Dr. Bayer Sachen, also shown in the middle here, he is currently a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Geoarchaeology, Geoanthropology. I'm sorry, and he is perhaps the leading one of the leading minds in uh, Mongolian archaeology. He's he's from Hofskol province, uh, which is up in the north in the Taiga area. And he is a deer stone and Hirixur culture specialist. And uh, he's going to he's going to lead some really interesting lectures on deer stone and Hirixur cultures um, that I'll talk about here in a second. So as we go out in this course, uh, we're going to visit some some of these deer stone sites and deer stones are what's pictured in this image here. Deer stones are these really iconic uh, sites in Mongolia. They're present in there. We call them Mongolian deer stones, but deer stones are present across Eurasia as far west as Ukraine. And they're really concentrated in Mongolia and they're associated with the early Bronze Age uh, Mongolian horse culture. So the, the deer stone culture basically represents the first Mongolian uh, horse horse people. And they're very iconic, very striking sites out in the steppe with these obelisks that are erected and carved with, as you can see in this image, the images of, of Mongolian elk. Um, they're, they're really, really fascinating sites. And they're associated with this other component I called, that I, I mentioned, Hirixurs. And the Hirixurs and the deer stones together represent this, this early Bronze Age Mongolian horse culture. Hirixurs are these stone mounds that are erected typically with, um, with burials, human burials underneath them. And uh, deer stones are also uh, often associated with horse burials. So the the here the deer stone will be surrounded by these pit features, often with a, a horse skull buried in it. Um, so these are really, really fascinating and um, really cool archaeological manifestations. In addition to visiting these deer stone hirixur sites, we're also going to be visiting Harhorum, the ancient. Uh, capital of the Mongol Empire. Um, this is an this is an overview over an aerial view of um, the Irdenzo mon Monastery in Karhorum. Um, this is a it's an ancient site in Mongolia, and it will be visiting these sites that are basically, you know, the the remnants of Mongolian Empire um, sites. One of the Really cool things that we'll also be visit doing is on uh, the one of the the third to the last day of the course, we will be staying with the descendants of the last uh, Pony Express, the, the operators of the last Pony Express station in the original Mongolian Pony Express system. So we'll have an opportunity to to interact with. Um, basically the grandchildren of the people who ran the Mongolian Pony Express. Uh, and so this will be a really, really unique opportunity to engage with this component of history. So we, archeologically, the time from the Mongolian Pony Express till, till now is the blink of an eye, but these people, you know, it's, it's still their own family and they, they just have a deep connection to not just the recent past in terms of the Mongolian Pony Express, but also deeper, you know, all the way to the Bronze Age. These they're, these are the same people who have been living in this landscape and living with this horse culture uh, since time immemorial. So this is it's going to be a really cool opportunity to to engage with people who have been here for thousands of years and are still here uh, up till now. Of course, Mongolia is 
the the horse culture in Mongolia is is just extremely deep, and uh, I just can't emphasize how much horses are revered here as you know both ways to get around the landscape, but also almost part of the family. Um, it's it's a really special relationship that people have with horses here, uh, as you can see from these sites where they, people place the skulls of their revered racehorses adorned with these blue silk um, headbands, uh, and then the this the pedestrian stoplight you see there on the right, uh, which is go when you see the green horse and stop when you see the red horse. <laughs> So if you have questions about this course, um, you can email me, iheart at mongoliacenter.org or william.taylor at colorado.edu. Uh, so yeah, this course is gonna be super cool. And basically, Will, Dr. Taylor, didn't really want to teach a field, field school course and I didn't really want to either. So what we decided that would be a, a useful way to spend our time is go to places that we haven't had a chance to go to before. So we're going to visit sites that I've been here since 2017. I've never seen these sites. And we're going to visit sites where Dr. Taylor also has never visited, uh, but will be accompanied by uh, Dr. Bayersakhan there, who is, is from the region. And basically, we're going to do all the stuff that if Will and I were here by ourselves, we would go be doing. Um, so it, it's it's just going to be a really cool opportunity. Um, Our, Isaac, can I can I present next because I have to leave in twenty yes, minutes. So, go ahead. Um, I just am getting aware of timing and don't want to be gone by the time we get to this. So I just want to talk a little bit about the Step Ethnographies Field School, which I'm running in collaboration with my colleague Mukherdin Gantotga, also known as Muho or Mogi. And um, so I'll talk, talk, talk to you about it um, in more detail, uh, but basically the, he and I are running this. I'm a departmental lecturer in human geography at the University of Oxford. I have been, um, the first time I was in Mongolia was in 2004 when I was a university student. And I became a member of ACMS when it was only two years old. Um, so I've been uh, connected to ACMS and also Mongolia for many years. Uh, did a Fulbright uh, fellowship there as well. And um, all of my work has focused mainly on rural Mongolia, mobile pastoralism, rural governance. But I'm also heavily involved in advocacy for mobile pastoralists around the world. And currently, our group is working with the uh, Special Rapporteur on Indigenous Issues at the UN because they've opened a big um, thematic report on rights for mobile Indigenous peoples, um, people who have been largely ignored um, within the wider Indigenous rights movement and also, generally speaking, um, many governments. So this is a lot of the material you'll get is based on um, these wider engagements globally with mobile peoples and specifically in Mongolia. Um, Mukherdin Gantotga, he is a PhD student here in geography. Um, he also grew up in Bayanhangur. He was from a pastoralist household himself. Um, he's an expert in development studies. His project focuses on digital pastoralism, how pastoralism is transforming through digital, um, the digital environment um, and also through use of new media. Um, and he also is an expert on the anthropology of capitalism in Mongolia. And we both published quite a lot on these topics. Um, so the objectives of the field school are really, um, we, we might be a little bit more um, uh, strict in terms of the academics because we're going to give you a lot of readings. It would be equivalent to almost a master's level here at Oxford. Um, we want to be able to identify research approaches, knowing how and when to implement those type of methods, equipping you with the skills to do those methods. Um, to be able to recognize elements of Mongolian mobile pastoralism, um, what distinguishes it as a livelihood, but also cultural um, form, um, and its uh, and its wider um, implications for the environment and politics. And um, related to rural Mongolia, of course, rural Mongolia has not been outside of development. Livestock were collectivized during the socialist period in Mongolia for seventy years. 
So we want to think about how development has been framed and be critical of this. Um, so we're not development practitioners. We're not trying to advance any agenda. We're trying to stand back and think about what ideas have been promulgated and what impacts they've had in rural Mongolia. Um, and then we're also going to synthesize our learnings through um, a final exhibition or presentation. It's your choice, but we'll set up a space to do this with um, with the other program who's going to Pustai National Park. We'll have a collective kind of um, synthesis of what everyone has learned. So it will be a very immersive experience, but also we will give you readings. We will give you materials to think about and discuss during the course of the, the time in the countryside. Um, so we're gonna be headed mainly to Bainhunger. This is a field site that I've gone back to for um, at least a decade, but my or original friendships started when I was a student there in Mongolia 2004. Um, Muko is from Bayanhunger as well. That's his <laughs> primary area of work. And we're going to go to Bayanhunger um, to explore um, relations between herders and the provincial center, spend time living with herders. Um, so there won't be many um, facilities. There won't be um, showers every day. There won't be um, toilets with running water. So please be aware of those issues. Um, if you're uncomfortable, uh, then it, it won't be easy. We, we won't be able to make many accommodations um, for, for people that need running water uh, for about four or five days. Um, okay, so we're gonna go to Ulti. It's about 10 hours from the from Ulaanbaatar. As academics, we travel by public bus because we're anthropologists. Um, we want to experience what people experience in Mongolia, how they travel. They travel by public bus. So we're gonna be doing the same. It takes approximately 10 hours. Um, and then we will have our time split between the provincial center to give you a little bit of respite. We can stay at a hotel there for one or two nights and get a sense of um, the markets and how herders interact with the provincial center. And then we will also go to stay with herder families that we've known for many years. Um, so it'll be a very hands-on experience. We'll expect you to herd livestock. We'll expect you to help collect dried dung for fuel, um, make dairy products, help out in everyday activities that herders are doing. Um, so again, it's not this is not going to be a, an experience for people who are uncomfortable in rural environments. Um, but we can make accommodations if people have mobility issues. Um, you know, you don't, you won't be required to um, to do any heavy labor, for example. But just be be prepared for that type of environment. And again, it's not very far from the provincial center. There's a hospital there, and there's facilities in case anyone needs to um, take a break or uh, need needs uh, attention of that kind. So that's a basic summary of the the field school. This is Muko. He's there um, with the hat and glasses on um, at one of the markets in the provincial center that we're going to visit to spend time with herders who sell their fermented horse milk and milk and dairy products. Um, so I hope it gives you a sense of the mix of things we'll do. Um, but I just want to reiterate, we are going to be living with herders. They will be um, cooking meat and eating meat themselves. We can make accommodation for vegetarians. But be aware that this is a culture that lives in very close proximity to livestock, which is their primary source of food. So if you have any qualms about um, living close to livestock, then this might not be the best field school for you. Um, so I'll just stop there and hopefully it gives you a good sense of what we're planning to do. OK, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for participating in this uh, information webinar about ACMS 2024 Field School Program. Um, I'm uh, my name is Tirma Niemdala. Uh, I'm leading Osta National Park uh, Field School this year. First, uh, I will provide a brief introduction of myself and other five instructors since they are not uh, available for today's webinar. Uh, now, let me introduce myself. Uh, uh, I'm working as a uh, as an instructor in the Department of Public Administration at National University of Mongolia. Also, I am a PhD candidate in Natural Resources and Sustainability Program at uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks. Currently, I am completing a research on implementation of 
uh, community-based natural resources management principles for uh, protecting the buffer zone rangelands at Hosta National Park, Mongolia. The next instructor is Dr. Usuf Chargal Dorj. He is a professional uh, biologist and uh, he has been working as a wildlife and wild horse biologist and research and training manager at Hosta National Park, Mongolia since 2003. His research uh, focuses on wildlife, dynamics, and ecology. Next uh, instructor is Mr. Piam Dorch. He holds um, key roles as director at Mon Green LLC and Mon Primi International LLC. His um, expert expertise encompasses nature conservation, protected area and buffer zone management and ecotourism. Um, he, has, uh, he has previously worked as a buffer zone manager at Hosta National Park, Mongolia between 2005 and 2015. And uh, next we, we will have uh, Mr. Oum Bayer Gambot. He has been working as a wildlife biologist and protection manager at Hosta National Park since 2012. Specializing in uh, carnivore studies, he excels in law enforcement, law regulation and conservation planning. Currently pursuing a PhD at Mongolian University of Life Science. He is uh, dedicated to studying wolves in the park. Next instructor is uh, Dr. Sirin Dolom Sirin Ochu. She works as a uh, botanist at the uh, park, specializing in a botanical uh, branch. She has gained expertise. Uh, through active participation in the field training and studies, including ecological field methodology, vegetation monitoring research, nutritional analysis, and initiatives focused on improving uh, degraded pastures. And we will have a, a, an assistant during the field school. Uh, Mr. Batsayat Soft will play assistance role. He has been working as a wildlife and uh, wild horse biologist at the park. His scientific uh, pursuit involves studying wildlife populations and examining ecological factors influencing their distributions and numbers. Presently, he is a, a PhD candidate at the Department of Biology at the uh, National University of Mongolia. Before uh, delving into key aspects of our field school, I will provide a basic understanding of Hosta National Park. Hosta National Park is one of the national parks in Mongolia. The park was established to implement the reintroduction of Prizwaski horses in Hosta Nuru in um, 1992. Prizwaski horse is a greater endangered species of horse. The Prizwaski horse is also considered to be the last surviving uh, species of wildlife, wild horse in the world. Currently, um, World's large number, uh, number of Pirzwaski horse exists in Hosta National Park. The total population of Pirzwaski horse reached uh, uh, 423 in 20, 2022. Then also the park uh, protects other uh, important wildlife, including red deer, Mongolian gazelle, argali sheep, uh, wolves, and uh, marmots. Next slide, please. Mm. The field school focuses on three key aspects. Firstly, participants will explore biodiversity conservation in Hosta National Park, and um, participants will spend valuable time in Hosta National Park by learning its important biodiversity and conservation initiatives. The course offers a great opportunity to, to obtain a comprehensive understanding of park's unique attributes, including its management strategies and innovative you know, wildlife conservation methodologies. Through hands-on um, fieldwork, participants will engage in observation and study of Brzozowski horses, along with other species such as Mongol Nile, gazelles, argali sheep, marmots, and gray wolves. 
Also, uh, participants will get involved in crucial activities like vegetation biomass assessments, refining their skill in ecological resource techniques to effectively collect and analyze crucial data supporting conservation endeavors. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, the second aspect of our field school is community-based conservation. Through exploring the concept of community-based conservation, we will examine its profound uh, implication within both park and its adjacent uh, buffer zone area. We will uh, witness uh, firsthand the positive outcomes of sustainable resource management on local communities' livelihoods, including herders, by visiting, visiting local enterprises such as ecotourism enterprises, community scale uh, cheese factories and sustainable sheep buckthorn horticulture operations. Additionally, the participants learn about how community-based natural resource management has been implemented within the buffer zone and it, the importance of implementing community-based rangeland management for the uh, buffer zone protection. Next slide. The third uh, cultural aspect of our field school is related to Mongolian traditional culture. This exhibition will also translate scientific exploration, offering a rich immersion uh, experience. Also, uh, participants will partake in traditional festival, visit the reward uh, Kandam Monastery and explore the Mongolian uh, National History Museum. The course will uh, provide participant the essence of uh, Mongolia's ancient traditions and heritage by making participants to engage with older families along with practicing cultural activities like uh, horse and camel riding, traditional food preparation and participation in traditional games. Also participants will uh, witness innovative uh, solutions in action through a visit to Mongolian Bahar dog breeding project showcasing a traditional approach to combat certification and consider uh, wild rangelands. Yeah, that's all uh, for today's webinar. If you have any questions, let me know. Also, there is uh, Dr. Uh, Miller. He has been uh, into Hostel National Park many times, so uh, he can uh, provide some experience at the park. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you, Therma. Um, my name is Daniel Miller. I'm actually not a doctor. I never finished a PhD, but I have long experience in Mongolia, especially as a range livestock person. Mm -hmm. And Hustai National Park is really a, gr or this course is a great opportunity to learn about the Prezhebowski horse, the uh, Taki, other wildlife that's found there, and the vegetation uh, of the park. Hustai is unique because in the core area where they do not uh, allow livestock grazing, the rangelands are in very good condition. It's not overgrazed by livestock. So you get to see some, I won't say pristine, but you'll get to see some rangelands that are in you know spectacular condition. And in late July, when this course is held, the flowers will be out, the grass will be green and lush. It's a great time to be there. And also, um, the uh, headquarters uh, of the park is where I understand uh, the participants will be staying is a great gear camp. Uh, that's what it's yeah. called, you know, the yurts, uh, gear camp to stay at. Um, great food. Um, and just you can just walk out from the park from the headquarters in the evening or, or mornings to uh, see things. Um, it's a great opportunity to learn about the herders that are in the buffer zones of the area and how Hustai National Park is really a a new model for wildlife conservation that you know involves the local participants. So um, just to make a plug for this course, it's a fantastic uh, opportunity to be in a really unique part of Mongolia.